Well, good afternoon. We want to welcome everybody to our latest Lunch and Learn, brought to you by the Community Broadband Action Network. I'm Curtis Dean, and I am uh, one of the co-founders of CBAN. I see a couple of you that are on the webinar have been with us before, so you probably know the drill. Uh, Todd Kilkop is on the line and on video, as well as our guest uh, presenter. So just to tee that up right now, I want to introduce you all to Lenny Huey. Uh, Lenny, I met him a couple of weeks ago at a presentation he was giving to a community broadband network here in Iowa that is in the process of getting ready to roll out services. And so um, he had a lot, just great information in that presentation uh, that I really enjoyed hearing about on, on data usage. And so I thought this would be a fantastic topic for our uh, latest Lunch and Learn. So Lenny, thanks for coming on with us. Hey, thanks, Curtis. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. So uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself, Lenny. I, I, you sent me a bio, and I was going to read it, but I figured I'll just <laughs> let it come right from your mouth. Well, I'll, I'll try to do some justice, and uh, hopefully okay. I remember what I, I wrote. Um, but, uh, yeah. So Don't I tell any tall tales. We'll figure it out. Yeah. With, with technology today, you just have to quickly link in me and and figure out if I'm lying or not. <laughs> uh, I've been with the telecommunication space for about 20 years now, on and off. Um, I worked as a product manager, uh, both from a marketing side as well as a hardware certification perspective. Um, went to solution consulting, um, enterprise architecture. Then I got into the uh, sales space and did some consulting uh, for the oil and gas industry, retail, uh, and then led me more into the software space where I, I was with a company called Salesforce for a few years uh, and then joined Calix about six months ago to um, be one of their uh, smart home and uh, cloud specialists. So here I am today and just uh, what I, I find myself doing a lot of times is evangelizing the value of cloud and what, uh, what Calix can do from a marketing and sales perspective to help operators uh, effectively um, understand and, and improve the experience of their subscribers. Fantastic. Well, you do have a lot of great information. So um, we want to let everybody know that's uh, attending right now. We will have an opportunity for questions uh, as time goes on. If you have a question, uh, you can always use the chat window. There's also a Q&A function here that you can type a question and uh, we'll come and circle back around to those as uh, we move forward. So right now, um, Lenny, I'm just going to kind of hand it off to you and uh, let you uh, share a little bit about uh, what you've learned. I'll move on sure. for screen here. Perfect. Thank you. All right. You're not seeing it, are you? Uh, I do see your community broadband. Yep. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Well, I wasn't seeing it. Let's put it that way. So, you know, nothing like, uh, nothing like the uh, guy in charge of tech technology and I are not getting along well today, Lenny, I can assure you. Um, but we won't go there. Okay. Now we should see that slide, right? I see the Community Broadband Action Network Lunch and Learn. That's the one. And now I'm going to be moving on to your slide. Awesome. Yeah, so Curtis asked me to uh, spend some time talking about the future of da home data usage. Um, gave me an opportunity to kind of just really think about where this industry is going. You know, you get caught up about talking about today and, you know, the impacts of what technology is doing today. And a lot of people just kind of forget, like, hey, are there trends that, are, are emerging right now that operators and you know people interested in getting into the service provider space um, are there considerations that they should really account for and hopefully some of the information I present will provide uh, some insight about where we sit where we think the technology is going and uh, provide you with some uh, more ammunition to make those proper business decisions all right uh, looks like a lot, but we're going to cover these off in fairly short order. Again, hopefully there's a um, um, good insight for you guys. But what we're going to cover is internet adoption over the years. I think it's always healthy just to look at where we are versus where we came from and you know use that as a, a, a model to measure out your trajectory. Uh, we'll look at a 60-second comparison. I love infographs, so you're going to probably see a few within this presentation. But I, I always find it astonishing when you look at, you know, the impact of all these trends and what does this mean from a minute by minute perspective. And I think some of these numbers that we'll share are, are going to be quite mind boggling. Um, contributing factors to the rise of usage, self-explanatory, but I think some visualization about 
you know, where a lot of the usage is coming from. You obviously have the standard, you know, the, the more common, commonly known ones like streaming or, or gaming, but what are other things that are factoring into the rise of that usage? Uh, talk about what's around the corner. So things that are coming that uh, operators need to prepare themselves for. And then ultimately we'll close it off with the battle of, uh, for the home. All right, this looks a little blurry. Um, I apologize for that. Um, it's probably because I had to render it down. But essentially what this is showing is on the left-hand side, it's a, it's a time graph based on the speeds available from service providers. So it's hard to see, but back in 2000, really operators were topping out at about 512 kilobits per second. Fast forward to this year, we're at one, one gig. You know, I'm based out of Canada and Bell, who I, I used to work for, they just rolled out 1.5 gig fiber to the home. So, you know, the, there is a fight, there's all, uh, obviously to increase that bandwidth, provide that accessibility to all of the homes. It is a costly endeavor, but there is value. And, and really the expectation is speeds are continually gonna get higher. Now with 5G coming around, you know, where, how does fiber to the home play into that? And what are the impacts of that? I think the industry is still trying to figure out the, the all of the use cases that 5G will come into play. But, you know, does that mean fiber will no longer be relevant? I, I don't think so at all. I think fiber is going to be even more relevant now inside the household. Um, on the right side, this is interesting as well, right? I think one of the biggest contributing factors to the rise of home data usage is the fact that larger demographics of age, education, people are now using the internet. So if we look back in 2000, 14% of 14% um, of people 65 and older were using the internet. Now, as we fast forward to this year, you have 73% of that population. That's a significant growth in just adoption. And this is partially because as people get older, you know, that, age group of 30 to 49 and 50 to 64, they're now getting into the next section, right? So that's inevitably gonna be um, increasing the usage. My daughter is six years old, my son is two, and they're both very confident using YouTube on my iPad, turning on my smart TV, going onto Netflix and, and navigating it better than my wife. So um, I think that trend of just the learning curve for younger people to, um, to be competent with the internet is just gonna be you know, increasing ever so much. Uh, so again, just looking over adoption over time, um, you know, this is availability of uh, broadband access. You know, in 2000, you're looking at just under 10% of the population. Now we're looking at 80% of penetration of broadband over time. So, you know, the availability is there. All of these factors are contributing to uh, adoption usage. On the right hand side, this is quite quite interesting you know the areas that are probably not served with any type of technology is surrounded by mountain ranges or just you know barren land all of the heavily populated areas and there's still a lot of room for growth right like if we look at um, all the kind of the teal lighter teal that's 33 to 66 percent of the population is covered with broadband so there's still a lot of areas that are not being served properly and that will continue to rise um, what i find most often is I'm in conversations with new operators that are coming online, trying to identify, you know, their target segmentations. Like, how do we acquire new subscribers? How do we leverage, you know, information and data so that we can effectively roll out a footprint of fiber uh, and and make it as cost effective as possible? So, Lenny, this uh, th these charts talking about broadband access and adoption. Are we, are, are we using the FCC definition of broadband here, 25 by three, or is yeah. it just internet access? No, this is, uh, we would be using the FCC uh, term for this, so their definition of broadband. So that's why it was so low in those early days on your chart on the left, just because there weren't a lot of providers that were doing 25 by three. Exactly, exactly. Now, okay. I actually think now um, most operators are trying to get away from that sub 100 service plan, um, most, a lot of people are now kind of entry level is a hundred, hundred by hundred, maybe it's right. still asymmetrical, but for the most part, it's starting at a hundred down. And some of the municipal, um, operators that are either under construction now or will be under construction here in Iowa 
are almost all starting out with that 100 megabit per second as kind of their base package. So, Yeah, and it's interesting that you, and I, I hope I'm not, you know, stealing any thunder or questions. No anymore. thunder, no thunder. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the operators I speak with, they really think 100 by 100 is more than sufficient. Subscribers and customers that I speak with, just even my own friends, they think, oh yeah, 100's no problem. But as we get through this presentation, you're going to see the 100 really isn't what it's cracked up to be. I think it's great for, you know, being able to have a few devices in your home, streaming your, you know, your Netflix and your over-the-top videos, uh, working from home. It's good to, it's a good service level, but I think as people become more um, reliant on, you know, broadband and at faster speeds for whatever they're doing, connecting more devices in their home. The hundred is really that entry point. You're, you're going to really need to start looking at hired service plans because of that, that uh, shift for things that are happening inside the home. And it's not always going to be consistently the need is there, right? It's going to be that, that peak need is Correct. growing. You know, overall usage and, and bandwidth utilization is growing, and then those peaks keep getting more and more, more devices demand more and more stuff. So exactly. So now I'm stealing your thunder. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right. Um, oh, I wish uh, I wish the the slides came out a little better. Um, yeah, I, I, I convert. Well, you sent me the PDFs, yeah, and I converted I it to remember, yeah. images. So, so I'm, this, I'm lost want, I can share my screen. I have the presentation available. Go like, for it. That's even better. Let's do that. I think you have access to it. I do. All right. You should see my yes. feature of home data usage and not my presenter slides. Yes, you are. You, we see what you are presenting here. Yes. Perfect. Much sharper. Thank you. There we go. No problem. I'm going to shut mine down. Well, I mentioned, you know, my, my, uh, my fondness for infographs, and I always love kind of just displaying some information here. But last year or two years ago, within a minute, all of these stats were being calculated and you know being presented out now. But if we look at it, you know, uh, just taking a few for example here, you know, Facebook was accessing about nine hundred thousand logins every minute. It's increased to nine hundred seventy-three thousand. You know. Um, what other ones are, are worth looking at? Snapchat, you know, 1.8, now 2.4. Amount of money being spent online has increased almost $100,000 per minute. Now, you know, what, are the, what, are the, what does this mean is that more people are doing the research online. They're, they're, you know, watching reviews, watching box openings. Like everything is going to be in relation to each of these little pies. Mm -hmm. The increase in Instagram, social media is all, you know, every, every area has increased substantially. Like two years ago, you had 46,000 posts per minute. Now you're almost topping out at 175,000 posts per minute. Wow. Like reviews. Like just keep in mind, this is one minute of every day. This is happening. Uh, and I think other indicators like the, uh, you got the voice first device shipped. There's 50. Now there's 67. So there's an increase of, voice activated assistance like Echo, Google Homes. Um, yeah, so you can see just the general increase of just usage alone is, is increasing uh, year by year. And that's one thing I think that the average consumer doesn't understand, Lenny, is when you talk to your box, and I'd say the A word's name right now, but she's right up here on a shelf and she'll <laughs> start talking to me. If I say blank, do this, yeah. it's the intelligence goes out to the cloud to process that order and come back. So it's using internet access bandwidth yeah. just to interpret your command. Yeah. Uh, and you know, this may be a scary thought, but it's always listening. So there's always a connectivity requirement so that when you say, Alexa, wake up or what time is it? Try not to <laughs> try to say it a little softer, but a hey, wake up or what time is it? What's the forecast? Tell me the news. Like my entire house is outfitted with echo devices so that if I wake up, I go to sleep, it triggers all of these actions so that I don't need to get up, lock my door, turn my thermostat down to 21.5 or whatnot. Um, and it's always requiring access. You know, one other thing that I found interesting, it's kind of scary as well is that certain echo devices 
will allow you to have a conversation with it. So if you want it, if you have one at home, I know this is more in the United States versus Canada. But if you say, let's chat or let's have a conversation, it will start having a conversation. And it, it's almost scary because to think it, it started asking me about horror movies. And I'm like, well, I, I love horror movies. And I had a conversation with my cousin who was over one day and they're asking, we we're talking about scary movies. And then when I had a conversation with my echo, it specifically asked me what horror movies I'd liked and have I, am I planning on watching the latest one that's in the theater? Wow. Yeah. It's uh, it's becoming more intuitive. You it's need me to buy you tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if that was around the corner. Well, you know, I, I think that you, the, the always on, always listening, that does scare some people. Um, yeah. Some people have embraced it and others are a little more, have more privacy concerns. Um, and, and so the, the nice thing is, I think, you know, is that people can choose just not to use those devices Correct. if they want to. Uh, you, no one's requiring anyone to use a, a, a Siri device or any of those others. So, um, but if you use them, yeah, you, you, you're, you, somebody can hear you. Yeah. And, you know, this brings up a very interesting point on, you know, the adoption of just new technology, right? A lot of people turn a blind eye to, you know, protecting themselves and protecting their own data, right? Your data is very valuable. And if you're going to, you know, promote voice assistant services and all this new technology and really embrace it, I think there's another side of it is where you need to also address the security aspects and, you know, the controls. My kids are getting older. I can't always watch what they're doing on the internet. So having a parental control is going to be very helpful for me and just give my, me and my wife some peace of mind, uh, as well as the network security, right? Like you're doing a lot of transactions. I think the world is becoming a very digital world. You know, currency is now digital, like they have bitcoins, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that there's restaurants now where I live that don't take cash. You have to pay by you know, <laughs> Apple Pay, Google Pay, or Android Pay. Um, so, you know, as you're exposing yourself to more and more technology that have risks factors to it, you just have to also think about how do I mitigate my risks and is that introducing network security within my household or being able to offer your subscribers, you know, an avenue to say, hey, I understand that you want to adopt new technology. We're going to help you with that, but we're also going to keep your interests safe by offering network security services, solutions, right. tools. I think it's a it's not just, hey, we're gonna release this new product. It's also hey, we're going to release this product and support it, but how do we also provide our subscribers a peace of mind? Yeah, absolutely. Great point. All right. So looking at some of the factors contributing to the rise of data usage, I've, I've kind of segmented a few out in no particular order because everyone's going to you know, do more things of one than another. But e-commerce, I think that goes without saying. Amazon and companies like Alibaba, um, Rakuten, they are now really, they're really changing the way that people shop, right? Uh, Amazon allows you to, they'll pre-order everything on a schedule so that based on algorithms and machine learning, they know when you're going to run out of toilet paper or paper towel and re-up your order without you even needing to go into the app and, and making that purchase. Um, the shift in the United States, there's more adoption for e-commerce than there is in Canada. Canada historically is more conservative, so we kind of watch what, you know, our, our neighbors to the south are doing and then we'll start embracing it but even in canada it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger it's just a huge market in the united states and if you think about some of the the regional areas where they don't have access to all those large department stores those great big brand stores mm -hmm. having access to amazon and really getting the products that people want that are not typically easy to to get uh, it's leveling that playing field and i can only think as more internet adoption and more bandwidth becomes available to the rural areas, this is going to explode even more. Kind of scary if you're a retailer in a small town too. Yeah, yeah, totally. It is very small, right? It's uh, the whole Walmart uh, yep. uh, case study of, of what they've done. So it is scary, uh, but I think this, you know, if I think about it from a, a business owner's perspective, uh, this this is also an opportunity. It's a threat, but it's an opportunity for them to really redesign or re really rethink the way that they do business 
just because you're small doesn't mean you can't run an e-commerce site. Um, mm -hmm. I've ran, I've ran three e-commerce sites myself. Um, and I never had a storefront. I just completely went online, targeted certain areas. And, you know, first year I was doing, I think I made about 486,000 revenue on the first year. So this is only through my own e-commerce. I never even looked at Amazon. When I started going into Amazon, it was, it was more competitive, but you, know, you, you give up some margins for convenience. But right. uh, yeah, it's definitely something that I think small business owners should really start looking at how do they leverage e-commerce platforms to, to help them. And it opens up their market as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, work from home. This is me. This is, Probably Curtis this is probably everybody that could be on the call, right? It's uh, right. I work from home. Uh, when I'm not traveling, I'm sitting in my home office, um, and I, you know, I I probably pound through you know, three hours of video calls a day, uh, doing uploading files. I, I work a lot, so uh, having accessibility <laughs> is is paramount, right? And having ubiquitous Wi-Fi within my house, because you know the reality is I'm not on a clock. I might be working at the dinner table. My wife right. might be watching TV. I'll sit next to her doing work. Having coverage throughout my house is that important for me. And the backyard. Don't forget the backyard. the backyard. I just finished my deck, so I, I am looking forward to working in my backyard. Okay, other factors. Uh, OTT or over-the-top streaming. Um, this is a big trend. You know, like everyone heard of Netflix. But really, there's other services that are now becoming available. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more. I have a slide prepared for some of the new over-the-top streaming applications coming out where you need to just familiarize yourself with it. What is the impact and what does this mean? Gaming is another big thing. So, you know, my job within Calyx is we help customers identify the three big personas that a subscriber can be engaging in. One is streaming, so watching YouTube, watching HBO Go, Netflix, so forth. The other one is gaming. So are you playing Fortnite you know, 20 hours a day? Are you playing on Xbox or PS4? What are the gaming consoles that are more used? And you know, how do you piggyback that on that knowledge and, and promote to your gaming subscribers to increase their usage? Just you know, piece, uh, you know, little tidbit of information here. Streaming and gaming usage, they're typically coming from the same person. Hmm. Uh, and we find that gamers are the heaviest bandwidth consumers, uh, rightfully so, because you're you know, playing online, playing, uh, you need heavy band high bandwidth, um, high throughput as well too. But we found that gamers are usually streamers because what they're doing is after they're gaming, they're going on YouTube and streaming all Watching. of the live videos yeah. of you know Ninja playing Fortnite. Um, and I don't know if you heard, but recently uh, a 16 year old won three million dollars playing Fortnite. I did. So I did see that. You I can did. imagine that everybody will now be playing Fortnite. I'm on the I'm on the Fortnite train now because <laughs> I, I'm trying to get my son into play. And hey, this is your this is your new career going forward. Well, I maybe maybe I'm uh, just a late bloomer, uh, and I'm still looking for my niche to something <laughs> I can be really good at. Maybe it would be a video game. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, uh, I there's thought some of those folks now that are not just monetizing it by going to a tournament like that the young man you referenced, but they're monetizing it online by if they're good and they have their own gaming channel like on Twitch, and people are watching it, they're getting ad revenue from that. For sure. For sure, um, you yeah, know I don't know if everyone knows this, knows this, but uh, Twitch was acquired by Amazon mm -hmm. a few years back, and you know people kind of wonder like, what are they doing? Like they're not even in this space. But the amount of revenue that Twitch generates just through advertisements alone, uh, the traffic that they get from their their subscriber base, like they, it's very complementary to um, over Amazon's overall strategy as becoming a, a you know a data provider. Oh, we can, I can add that uh, I know there's colleges here in Iowa that are even formalizing uh, recruitment strategies around the gaming uh, population and how that falls into computer science and STEM students. Uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Definitely on the right side of history that you have to have the bandwidth in order to find yeah. that. I remember just kind of taking you through my own history lesson. I was in grade nine. And this was the, my first exposure to like computing classes. And my keyboard was literally a piece of paper 
cut out in a QWERTY keyboard and I had to learn how to type on a <laughs> paper on the desk. That was my, that was my exposure to computers in grade nine outside of my house having a, you know, like a two well, Lenny, that, that's a sad story, but you never had to learn to type on a manual typewriter. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd rather have cut Fair out. Enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but so just kind of like finishing off on this slide here, I, I want to just use an image on the gaming side because this is really where things are, are, are going right like you have the gaming consoles but now there's you know the adoption of vr and augmented reality like looking at this gaming system this is probably very expensive first and foremost but you know just looking at this and saying well i could put on a headpiece ride a motorcycle and feel like i'm riding a game in a game like this is this is mind-boggling to see to think where this is going Wow. Yeah. All right. So other, other factors, uh, you know, kind of staying on the, the work from home. You also have the students now, right? Like they are, they're encouraged to carry iPads, um, digital tablets, devices, bring computers to class because, you know, the reality is you can find so much information uh, through the internet and just, you know, rather than carrying 14 textbooks, a lot of the curriculum is accessible online. Uh, a lot of universities now offer uh, like a digital passcode that gets you into all of your uh, curriculums and get gets your uh, school books through kind of like a carousel and a uh, virtual uh, bookstore. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine that usage for working from home and homework and education, they're probably going to be very similar in terms of uh, uh, bandwidth requirements. Mm -hmm. The one that a lot of people overthink is, is staying connected right? as Populations get older, and you know your children move out. They have children. Everyone wants to stay connected. Twenty years ago, being able to do a video call was just unheard of, right? No one could even think, fathom the idea that this was going to be possible. Now you can do group calls. Like my mom is the one that group call chats me with me, my brother, my wife, and we're all on our phone just doing a FaceTime session just to stay connected with with uh, my family. Huh. They do account for quite a lot of usage, right? Because you're looking at the requirement to have a, a steady up and down speed, uh, connecting multiple sources. So this is ultimately increasing the data usage. Being a 21st century uh, grandparent, I can tell you it's a, it's a huge uh, boost to be able to, um, whenever really you need to or want to, check in with the the kids, the grandkids, mm -hmm. and get that face that FaceTime that you know, the generation before us would have had to drive, you know, many hours to enjoy that. So it's really kind of, I think it's going to really help bring families closer together just as they share the, you know, share that journey as their children grow up and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, when I was putting this together, I, I remember something that you said um, when we last met during the presentation, mm -hmm. the, the majority of people that were asking for fiber and new internet service in that, in that city were the older, older yeah. generation. Like they realized that, you know, having fiber or just like, you know, technology that levels the playing field is essential for the survival and just for this town. And I found that interesting because, you know, you figure, Oh, it's going to be the younger people that work from home and the ones that are, you no, know, it's, it's going to be the, the, the older people that realize, Hey, I need to stay connected with my family right. and for this town to prosper. We need to have technology that really allows businesses to thrive, people to come here and, and say, Hey, we want to live here because of these reasons. Absolutely. That, and I think you see that theme in a lot of small towns is I think yeah. the senior population, especially is very aware of what needs to be done to keep their communities vibrant. And that's one of the steps that they can do. Right. Right. I've, got, um, okay. I've got a question just about the, uh, can you describe a little bit on the education side as well as the gamification, the gaming side about the difference augmented reality is going to bring in terms of bandwidth needs? Good question. Uh, so I, I haven't, uh, I haven't dug into the bandwidth requirements for augmented reality. Obviously having a steady up and down is probably going to be kind of table stakes. Um, you know, from a homework side, research, you know, if you're looking at text-based 
type of content, bandwidth isn't going to be a major requirement. Right. Uh, but the reality is most people do their homework not by reading texts, right? They're not right. going to Google something and read a PDF. They're going to look for the easiest Coles notes, which will probably be YouTube, or they're going to be some sort of streaming site, right? Reddit probably has, you know, information that is, is helpful for uh, work from, uh, sorry, from uh, students. Uh, but from the gaming side, you know, just I, like I said, I, I haven't looked at the bandwidth requirements for AR or even VR, uh, but new gaming platforms that are coming out require, are saying that they require dedicated pipes of between 25 to 35 megabits per second, right? That's just so that you can have the resolution, the highest resolution, uh, the best quality of gameplay, minimal to low, no lag, um, and as AR becomes more widely used, virtual reality is still kind of ramping up. It's, it's more popular than AR right now because of the cost thing. But um, the, the technology was actually uh, the thing that's holding it up because, you know, if you ever tried a VR headset, mm -hmm. it, it, it can get a little, it can make you a bit dizzy because of the rendering. Yeah. So the refresh rate wasn't matching up properly. Um, now technology is kind of leveling it off. Uh, but you, yeah, like in terms of the bandwidth requirements, you know, I, I couldn't tell you to, unfortunately. Well, you know, there's, that, there's right, some that. college level, uh, I've been to some startups um, and seen their pitches and they're doing augmented reality on, and gaming or college level chemistry and yep. physics, mm -hmm. some of those where they're actually letting you do hands-on building blocks in order to earn the, or learn the concepts. So, yeah, so. I went to CES one year, and this is when VR was really kind of picking up, and you knew this was going to be the next big thing. Um, and for the most part, watching a VR headset, watching a movie, no problem, right? Playing a game was a bit of hit or miss, and this was a couple of years back. But then we did CES again, and there's one, one item. They had a a VR helmet the, it was a basketball player and he was taking three pointers, but using the helmet and it was, there was no delay. Like obviously if you're having a, a even a millisecond difference, it could throw off your timing. He was throwing, shooting three pointers, huh. watching only through a headset. So everything was just, he sees it through the headset, picks up the ball in virtual, but it's a real ball, throws it at the net. And there's no lag. Like it was just seamless, which was amazing. Um, now, if I were to just estimate what kind of bandwidth requirements for, he needed a, definitely a steady pipe, right? Like it yeah. was, I, I couldn't even guess how much you would need. I, you know, that's to me, the key is, is yeah, the, the speeds are important, but it's that, that, that reliability, that steadiness of that connection. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, Quite frankly, a lot of a lot of broadband providers fall short because they are they're operating older networks that perhaps don't have the kind of reliability. And you know, right. if there's a dropout even of a few seconds, it's going to ruin your experience with some of these new technologies. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point you make there, Curtis. Because I think it goes without saying, you know, like your the internet you buy, unless you're completely on the wrong package or service tier, for the most part, it should work, right? Like for the majority of the day when you're checking your emails or, you know, checking something on YouTube, you're probably not going to have any performance issues, but when it does have a performance issue, it's probably the time where you don't want it to have, right? Like right. People over or you're watching a movie or you're watching some sort of streaming thing. And then, Oh, what happens? You start getting lag and you start getting buffering. And that really is, is what's going to change someone's mindset from a, a happy subscriber to someone complaining about their service. And, you know, there's so many factors that play into it. Is it the bandwidth? What if you're on a gig service and you're just having all these service limit hits? It could even be just the position of where your home router is. Right. To, to where you are in the house, right? Is it just bad Wi-Fi coverage? People are quick to blame the service providers, say, your service sucks, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm timing out all the time. I don't get the advertised speeds. And really, I think just having the right tools in place to better understand how your subscribers are using their service and what information can be presented so that you can have an intelligent conversation to, to help them to say, well, did you realize 
you know, like, are you having a Wi-Fi problem? Well, where is your Wi-Fi router? Well, where's your router versus where you're watching TV, right? Just, and just having that conversation to understand like, okay, well maybe it's because your Wi-Fi is in a, your, your Wi-Fi coverage is bad. You need a right. vendor or something. Uh, and that's where, you know, a lot of companies like Calyx is investing into um, cloud technology or different technology that present data to, to our customers that allowed them to effectively address these new factors, these rises of data usage, you know, the adoption of smart home products, and be able to support that because as a service provider, you're going to be asked a lot of questions that you don't typically expect to answer. Right. Uh, and then the last item, Oh, sorry, the last, these two items, social media is definitely having an impact. If you kind of revert back to that 60 second slide, um, you may not think it's a lot of usage, but if you ever wonder if you find that yourself on social media a lot and you're wondering how much data am I actually using, go on your phone and take a look at all the apps and I guarantee WhatsApp was probably one of the highest and it's only a chat base, but everyone sends pictures, videos, so forth, Instagram. Now, um, they are, they're heavy data consumers and people don't realize, uh, you know, what type of, what type of bandwidth they actually require. Uh, next is IOT smart home. So I spent a lot of years evangelizing smart home. I was one of the first product managers at Bell to create the go to market strategy for IOT. Um, and, it's, you know, I think the numbers, and I don't have any numbers or stats to share, but, you know, the estimation from Ericsson and a number of different technology companies out there are saying, you know, 50 billion connected devices by 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's impossible. But think about how many connected devices you have in your own home. Like, I have 24, 23 devices. Why well, to return one? I have 23 connected devices at any given time. Right. And I'm, I'm, my wife asked me, uh, I think, uh, was it my wife? Yeah, she. Uh, someone asked me. I apologize. It was even you, Curtis. But uh, they asked me if you know if we're the norm. Like, hey, do are we are we the normal household now? Right? And yeah. What do you mean? She's like, well, we have a lot of devices connected. We don't have cable. Like, we stream our we stream every show on YouTube. Like, you pay for Netflix. You pay for YouTube Red. Um, we have like all these connected devices. Like, are we the normal? House. I'm like, you know what? That's a good question. I think we are a little higher than normal, right? Um, I think most people are still in that 10 to 15 device range that are connected yeah. to the home. Um, they still maybe have cable. They haven't cut the cord yet completely. I don't even have a home phone, right? Like all of my phones are cellular devices. So I think we're a little ahead of the curve, curve but it's, it's fast, closely approaching. Well, and, and a lot of those devices are passive. I mean, they're just doing their thing, right? Like the IoT devices, like that, uh, you know, the the Echo sitting up above me, staring at me right now. <laughs> the A word. Um, right. they're, they're just they're just using they're consuming data whether you're using them or not actively. So right, right. No, exactly. One of the uh, uh, just to share a quick story. One of the uh, my my uh, my wife and I are streaming. Exclusively now, and uh, we are um, using YouTube TV for our uh, multi-channel streaming service. Been pretty happy so far. But one thing I have to remind my my uh, wife is, if you know, if if you're watching TV and you get up and you just decide, oh, I'm going to go run some errands and you leave for a couple hours, turn it off because it's still going to be sitting there sucking data. Uh, and um, it, even though nobody's watching TV, as long as it's the TV's on and there's a picture on it, it is consuming data. And yeah. fortunately, I don't have a data cap for my provider, but people that do have data caps are probably in for a rude awakening um, if they switch to a streaming package and suddenly they find that their consumption just shot through the roof. Yeah, no, no, you make a good point. I, I even remind my daughter to get out of YouTube right on the TV because yeah. <laughs> what she'll do is she'll just switch to something other another app and is running in the background and when you yep. turn on to YouTube it's like the next video is just playing over and over yeah. again so you're like oh, man. Uh, I don't have a data cap either speaking of streaming that's a good segue to my next slide which is what's around the corner so uh, you know I think you're gonna see a big adoption from big companies now adopting uh, you know, software as a service or any type of subscription-based service. Disney has announced November 12th 
they'll be launching Disney Plus. They're expected to generate up to 130 million subscribers by 2024. Wow. This is to complement their over-the-top streaming services. So they'll have Hulu Plus, ESPN Plus, and Disney Plus. Disney Plus alone is going to be about $4 a month. So very easy, very cost-effective to get into. Anyone with a kid or has you know an interest in Star Wars or Marvel, they're going to be signing up. Like I'm, I'm totally going to sign up for the service, guaranteed. Yeah. So, right. Um, Google Stadia, which is the next one. This is Google's cloud-based gaming service. This is the one that they're saying to get 4K resolution. Resolution. We need a dedicated pipe of 35 megabits per second. Now, how does that impact? If you're on a 100 meg pipe, you just consume a big chunk of that. Not on top. Not including whatever what other devices inside your house are doing. Hmm. There's going to be a, a great impact to to have better throughput, better bandwidth. Um, and then next is going to be the Apple TV and Apple Arcades, which are releasing this year as well. This is on top of Microsoft's announcements of their gaming platform, which is xCloud uh, or Cloud X. Uh, but these are four services that are going to be very bandwidth intensive being released by major companies that you can assure that heavy adoption is going to happen. Or right? maybe Apple TV might not be as popular as Disney Plus, but I think these are considerations that as an operator, you're going to want to be able to, you know, satisfy and, and promote to your subscribers to say, hey, Google Stadia is coming out, you know, uh, high bandwidth intensive gaming system. Are you ready? We are, you know, that kind right. of thing. Uh, to get ahead of that and say, hey, you know, these are services that are coming that you can support, no problem. Yeah, these, uh, these, game, these online gaming platforms are interesting because they've kind of, uh, in some ways, that kind of lowered the barrier to entry for some people. It used to be that you wanted a PlayStation 4 or whatever the, that iteration was. You had to go yeah. drop three or $400. And it was, you know, people would wait till Christmas or whatever. And now with these things, it's the equipment requirements are smaller. Uh, mm -hmm. It's subscription-based. So you pay something every month. You know, I, have you heard what like Stadia is going to cost as a gaming platform? Yeah, early adopters are about $169 Canadian, so probably about $99 to get into it. Um, okay. This gives you access to the one remote. Of the Basically, the remote is the gaming console, right? Right. Um, and then once it releases, it'll probably go up to, I guess, a standardized price of, I'm guessing, between $150 to $200 US. But then you subscribe to individual games or a gaming service? That's a good question. Uh, they haven't announced that model yet. Okay. okay. So you would subscribe to, my guess is you're paying a monthly fee and you have access to every game. Gotcha. Okay. So that Apple Arcade will be working. You pay $10 a month or $20. You get access to all of the games that you want. And, you know, some, some of us older people might look at that and say, oh, gosh, who's going to pay $20 a month for something like that? Got to remember a lot of these pe uh, a lot of people, especially – generations um why and uh the millennials that is how they entertain themselves they don't go to movies anymore they don't watch a lot of scripted television programming they are that's their how they consume entertainment so um mm -hmm. if you're not in the, if your provider is not able to uh you know provide them with the experience they want they'll find another provider yeah. If one's available, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, like, I think from a, a gaming side, I, I never considered myself a gamer. Like, ever since I got rid of my Xbox, I have an Xbox 360. So, like, a few generations mm -hmm. old. It's not even plugged in. It's essentially a very expensive paperweight. But what I do is I play games on my phone. Like, as I'm killing time or just want a little bit of downtime, I'll play, I'll play Fortnite now. There's another game that I play that's very similar to it. But you know, having that experience and I'm actually playing against people on a, on a computer system. I'm playing against people on Xbox or PS4 from my oh, wow. Mind. So it's, you know, like everything is converging. Um, and you know, the introduction of Google Stadia and, and Microsoft's cloud gaming platform, it was inevitable. Like they see that, Hey, we can continue with a recurring subscription. Like they're always, this is the model that everyone is trying to, find or get to is find that you know recurring revenue what services can we offer like cloud is definitely the the mechanism that allows companies to, to monetize it effectively um, and then this slide here is really the battle for your home and I took some excerpts out of some some uh, 
you know, reputable sites, The Verge, TechCrunch, Business Insider. And as a service provider, these are your big threats. They're going to be the Googles. They're going to be the Amazons. And, you know, it might be, it might sound overwhelming. Like, how am I going to compete with an Amazon, right? They can buy, they can buy FedEx without even thinking probably. <laughs> right. Um, but they know that being able to own the home is the next battlefield. Google is a data company. They want data. So what they are even doing is they're changing their strategy to kicking out all of their partners right now. So they are creating an ecosystem similar to Apple where no one else can, mm. can uh, I guess, share or take some of their intellectual property. Um, I don't know if that strategy is a good one. I, I right. personally agree with it because they're trying to close off that ecosystem and say, you buy a Nest, you get Google Home, you get Google Home Assistant, all these services, but they don't have to share their IP out. Amazon, on the other hand, saying, no, 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 well, you know, we understand the value of the home, but we want to be an e-commerce platform. We want people to buy from us, buy products from us. So they bought, buy into Eero, which is that Wi-Fi mesh system, right? Uh, Google has the Google Wi-Fi system. So they know that being able to provide that coverage and collect data on how, how, what is happening inside that house allows them to think of the next product to introduce next service to invest into um, Amazon's model. And they've always been doing this was find a product that is, you know, under sold, under marketed like Eero, really, really good product Buy them, offer them as an Amazon product. Now you're collecting data inside that home. Hmm. Um, the other model that they do is that if you're selling on Amazon and you're selling it, selling very well, they look at trying to reproduce that and undercutting you. That is their other model. Google, they just want to own your data. Um, and then the smart speakers this is another thing. This is uh, everyone's getting into this space because of the popularity of it. Yeah. Like if you look at the stat, U.S. smart speaker owners grew 40% over 2018, now reaching 66.4 million people. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Every company, Apple's in it. Um, you know, you can make your own smart speaker now. So. Sonos, they're all up, they're all there. So the reality is, you know, being able to not just provide internet, but providing your subscribers with, you know, world class experience, like, um, and, and just, you know, servicing them where anticipating what services that they'll need and being able to offer them versus them going out to Amazon, going out to Google, going out to other e commerce platforms and buying them where right. you're going to have to support wouldn't it be nice if you can offer them internet but also be able to layer on services that are applicable in the home so that you can support that and, and retain that revenue from that that's really been a um a, a shift that providers some providers have struggled with um lenny the the shift of being just the dumb pipe provider that gets you right really fast broadband and, and my obligation as the provider ends at that box on your outside of your house or maybe inside of your house. The shift from there to, okay, my service ends not at that box, but it ends at the device of the customer because that's what they expect. Most people don't, they don't know the difference between Wi-Fi and internet. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, no, you're, you're exactly right. It's, um, you know, we, we've been preaching this at Calix that the service providers, they're in a very unique position. Like maybe it was taken for granted for a long time where they're like, hey, we're just providing a pipe. Right. Um, maybe you have a few service providers that are forward looking to say, hey, how do we improve customer experience? How do we, how do we increase our NPS score, right? How do we get looked at as a, as a solution versus a problem? Um, and we've been talking like, hey, you know, as a service provider, you you are owning the home. You have to own that antenna, provide the services that people want, and really take the efforts to understand how your your services are being used, so that you can effectively create messages and support and services to better support um, these subscribers going forward. You know, the expectation now is, you know, you you don't want to commoditize your product, but you know, being able to offer, you know. Uh, concierge services or all these out of the box thinking to increase experience that will 
that will pay for itself in the investment. Because for me, if I'm going to save $5, I don't really care about that. I'd rather, you know, have customer service know who I am. No, like rather than me having to dial one and repeat my name or repeat my number. And all <laughs> that, it's like, Hey, I call in, they know who I am and just, you know, delight me with that type of experience. I will, I will be uh, a loyal business customer for them for a long time. If they can continue to do that. Well, that, that customer loyalty is one of the um, real, uh, you know, arrows in the quiver for municipal or community-based broadband providers, because um, of course uh, that loyalty has to be earned and has to be retained. And so, um, but when a municipal provider enters in a, a community, builds a network, they already have that goodwill piece that comes along with just being part of the community. And uh, one way to maintain that loyalty is to, you know, do everything you can to pr promote excellence within uh, your customer experience. And, you know, things like what you've been talking about are pretty important right. part of that. So. So we are, uh, we're kind of through uh, Lenny's slide. We want to just uh, extend, uh, uh, anybody has any questions, you can go to the question answer um, uh, bar down at the bottom of your screen. And I uh, will address those if any come up. Um, I, Todd, I wanted to mention one thing, you know, when we've been talking about um, that some of the communities that we've discussed broadband in, um, it seems like there's so many little pieces missing for what those folks expect in having a better broadband experience. And, you know, some of the things that Lenny just talked about really kind of feed back into that, don't they? The, the connectivity being maybe not as steady as they need or, or speeds in some cases are a real a vital need. Yeah, I think it's just a fragmented um, way of looking at quality of life issues in general. Right. Uh, and the digital divide's not just a digital divide among being educated about how, how it works, but it's also about how you get to live your life and where right. you and I think, you know, we try to educate policymakers um, to think outside of the walls of their community um, based on kind of a higher level of thinking about what quality of life is. Yeah. Lenny, I'm going to pick on you as a Canadian for just a minute, not because you're a Canadian, but because you live in a different country. One of the things I've always been fairly critical of uh, our own nation is it does not seem like the United States has ever really adopted a clear strategy for how to improve broadband infrastructure. It's been left to the devices of multiple private providers, or in some cases where uh, needs are especially acute and people are willing to take action, some municipal providers. Do you have, is there any kind of overriding or overarching broadband strategy in Canada, or is it kind of the same thing as here in the USA? Um, I think, there's there's no there's no overarching strategy like we have we have our version of the SEC here called the CRTC yeah kind of mandates uh, certain things availability is as the key so you know um, there's a mandate that every person they need to suffice uh, a, a specific broadband speed by a specific year I think it was 25 megabits down was the minimum that needs to be made available to I think 98% of the population by 2022 okay. um, and it's less complicated and less convoluted than the United States because there are just less of a population right we, right. Don't, we don't have as many service providers um, and we don't have as many territories right you have a number of states we have like nine provinces. Right. So it, it's fairly easy to standardize kind of a strategy within each province. Now, each province has its own nuances and own strategy that they'll like to deploy, right? Um, but there's, you know, it could be very different from Western Canada to Eastern Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have the three main service providers being Telus, Rogers, and Bell, they're the ones that dictate everything. So it's kind of right. an oligopoly. They're the ones that kind of sit in the corner of a room. And so it's really an old boys club that all these guys kind of grew up together, all the owners. And they they have agreements in place where they can be a CLEC, where they can be an ILEC. 
uh, and they kind of formulate their own, you know, like standardization model. Mm. Um, but the CRTC just is looking at for competition violations, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. It's probably less. It sounds like it's still a mixed mixed bag yeah. there as well as in the United States. It is, yeah. Like the three main carriers are the ones that resell the bandwidth out. No one's going to lay out their own fiber. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So speaking of fiber, is fiber to the home, um, uh, are those the percentages increasing in Canada? They are, yeah. It's just, it slowly just got made available, I think, late last year to the home connections, yeah. Okay, okay. Is it uh, still mostly people are on a DSL or a cable modem plant now, though, in Canada, kind of like we are here in the U.S.? Uh, no, uh, yeah, the majority of people are still going to be in, on DSL. Um, fiber to the node is more prevalent. Right. Fiber to the home. Gotcha. I live in a very, I, like a, I live in civilization. Like I have buildings around me. Right? Like I, I, but we don't have fiber to the home. You don't live in Letterkenny then? Right? <laughs> no, no. I wouldn't mind living in Letterkenny. Um, it, I'm going to just throw it back out if anybody has any questions. I'm not seeing any yet. So, hey, that means you are the most effective speaker ever, Lenny. <laughs> no effective uh, or boring. So yeah. Turned here. Um, and uh, as we as we go, just uh, I want to I want to give you a, a lot of thank you here, uh, Lenny, for being on the on the uh, webinar today. I also want to give a kudos to the folks at Calix who you work for. Calix is. Uh, one of our very first C-band vendor members. So we want to thank them for their support and maybe have you give your two minute pitch for Calix. <laughs> um, well, yeah, just, thanks for putting me on the spot here. I just, uh, I'm a new employee, but no, I definitely appreciate uh, the time and the opportunity to be here and speak with everybody. Uh, I do hope the information that was presented was helpful or at least insightful to some degree. Uh, and in terms of the partnership, I'm glad that Calix is, you know, making, making the effort to support organizations and associations and, and so forth. Uh, in terms of what, you know, my two seconds, uh, my 15 second elevator pitch on what <laughs> doing is, you know, we're, we're known as the you know, traditional network access provider vendor. We've made a business decision to become a software led business partner. A lot of, a lot of the reason is based on this information that I presented today and why we did this and why we're doing this to make that investment into cloud and new services is really to enable our customers to remain innovative to their own subscribers, being able to better understand the behaviors and the experiences that their, your subscribers and your customers are engaging in allows you to effectively market, promote, and recommend products and services that one will create new revenue streams for you. Uh, but also address four core areas for your business, which is acquire new subscribers, grow your ARPU, reduce your churn, and then expand your marketing operating expense. Um, you know, there's other aspects of what our cloud products do. There's the one from a support side, so frontline support um, and, and troubleshooting, triage. Uh, I'm on the sales and marketing side, so I'm there to enable the growth of your, your strategic plans and leveraging data insights to be able to effectively uh, compete with your competitors and, and mm -hmm. your guys out there. Well, just uh, coming from a guy that is uh, just working with some of these communities and am not a provider myself, you have some really cool stuff. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank and I'm you. hoping it's some really cool stuff that's going to make our lives easier in, in a couple of the, communities that I'm working with and, and that are going to be deploying Calyx gear out there for their access networks. So thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the time, Curtis. The lunch and learn that we're going to be having next month is uh, going to be a great topic and really would encourage everybody to um, register. It's Thursday, September 19th at noon as usual. And it is a uh, topic is the promises and pitfalls of open access fiber networks. Doug Dawson is going to be joining us. Doug is one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. He is one, he, he's kind of like the fiber uh, municipal broadband guru, one of them from across the nation. And he is going to be talking about uh, how some communities have built fiber networks, but rather than having a single provider on them, or for having the city be the provider. They've invited multiple uh, providers to come in and access that network. 
that model has been touted in many cases, but it's a little tricky to actually implement. So Doug is going to talk to us about some of his experiences with fiber networks that are open access. So we encourage you all to uh, join us for our next uh, C-Band Lunch and Learn that will be coming up here on September 19th. So with that, I'll thank my uh, co-founder, Todd, and of course, Lenny uh, uh, Huey from Calix for joining us today. And we'll see you next time here on C-Band Lunch and Learn.